Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk, still oh, yeah. in Saddleworth, England. Yes, we are. As we continue on in our study on the Sermon on the Mount, this being the 24th part of that study, 24 um, weeks that we've been doing this study. It's almost six months we've been in the study on the Sermon on the Mount. Wow. Uh, and, you know, even, even in that time, it's hard to get it all in. There's so much oh in the goodness. Word of God, and it, it just—it's an hour it, just doesn't. It's doesn't really, do it's it. really yeah, it's great hard. how much stuff, how much lots, food there is to feast on in that Word. So, um, I hope that you've had the opportunity to see some of the prior studies. If you've not, they're available online here at www.bibletalk.com. The entire series is on there, or will be on there as we finish up. Mm -hmm. um, Invite others to see it, because it's profitable, because it's the Word of God. Amen. Amen. All right, before we start, let me just, I want to just pray and say, oh, Father, hallelujah. thank you, Jesus. we rejoice in your promise that you've sent your Holy Spirit thank you. to lead us into all truth. And we rejoice in the fact that we know that your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, is the truth. And I pray during this time that we would see the truth that your Holy Spirit would lead us in your word and give us great understanding of what your desire for us is. Thank you, Lord. We praise you and thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're picking up, uh, we're just entering the seventh chapter. We're studying Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going into chapter 7, in this session. Yeah. And I I want to say first of all, let me well let me read this verse. Matthew seven one says this Do not judge so that you will not be judged. These are the words of Jesus Christ. Remember, he is teaching and training his disciples, his apostles, in righteousness mm -hmm. as he's sending them out now into the world, as the salt of the earth, as light of the world, right? Right. So but I also said in the very beginning of this, and I've said a few times screw that in a sense, what we call the Beatitudes, so that first part, the opening of the Sermon on the Mount, is basically the sermon, and everything else is commentary on it. Mm -hmm. So this verse, Matthew 7, 1, do not judge so you will not be judged, is actually the Lord's commentary on what he said at the beginning of this discourse, when he said, blessed are the merciful, and blessed are the peacemakers. Because that's what we're going to deal with here in judgment. And I have to say that I also believe that this topic, judgment, is one of the most difficult and one of the most dangerous subjects that we can cover in the Word of God. A simplistic view of this verse might easily convince a person that Jesus was at odds with the Apostle Paul. Because here's Jesus saying, don't judge, right? But let me read to you from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5, I'm going to start at verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. If he should be an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. But what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So here's Paul saying, well, you know, we don't judge, but we don't judge the outsiders. Now, it doesn't seem to me to be that way in the church. We spend all of our time, it seems to me, judging the outsiders. But here's Paul saying, no, we're not to judge the outsiders. God judges them but we are to judge those inside the church. That's what he's saying. So now the question is, is he at odds with Jesus Christ? I'm going to also tell you that an equally superficial examination of Scripture might even convince a person that Jesus was at odds with himself. This is Jesus, the Messiah, sent from the Father to save sinful mankind. Jesus, who says that he did not come into the world to judge it, John 3, 17, check it out, and then calls the Pharisees snakes, vipers, whitewashed tombs, hypocrites, 
and tells them that they are the father of the devil. And check it in John 8, 44, right? Jesus, who just a few verses later, here in Matthew, here in the Sermon on the Mount, will say, and I'm going to read here in chapter 7 from verse 15 and 16, Beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So, does that sound like it requires judging? I mean, if you're going to watch for false prophets and test them by their fruits, sure. isn't that judging them? That's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like, okay. So, if that requires judging, and Jesus says that we're not to judge, I think the issue here becomes our understanding of judging. Amen. Okay? Mm -hmm. Based on its context. Right. All right? Let me just tell you that it is clear through the Word of God that we are indeed to discern between good and evil. It says in Hebrews 5.14 that we're supposed to practice. It says that the solid food of the Word is for the mature who because of practice has his senses trained to discern between good and evil. And we can only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power, well, we'll get into that, but it's, mm -hmm. it is a form of judgment, yes. right? Now, there's an awful lot of godly forms of judgment, but that's what we'll talk about here. That, but that's why I'm saying this is dangerous, because people take simplistic views, and they'll fall on one side of this issue or the other, and take very simplistic views without really getting in and knowing the Word. Okay? Let me ask you, have you do you have a definition of judgment? Yeah, I do. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, God has appointed in the church. I'm, I'm putting her question off for a while. I gathered right. that, yes. God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. To equip the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body. Right. Okay. Let me just take one of those for, for the moment. Prophets. What's the role of a prophet? Well, now, too often today in, in the church you would think, well, they come along, it's like the, it's like the, Christian, psychic, it's like the Christian psychic hotline. Yeah, They're like yeah. fortune tellers. Mm -hmm. Tell you how you're going to get rich and famous. Well, the fact of the matter is, I just want to read you this from Lamentations 2.14. God speaking, and he says, Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have, listen to this now, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. So the Lord is complaining because they have not exposed the iniquity of the people. Okay. Well, hmm. Doesn't that, wouldn't that sound like judging? Yes, it would. I have to tell you that years and years ago, I mean, I'm going back into the late 70s, uh, I did a, a live radio show in New York, in the suburbs of New York City. And, mm -hmm. and Alice would go, to me, go with me to the studio every Saturday. It was a live broadcast for half an hour every Saturday. And Pam. And Pam Rizzoni. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the two of them would go with me and sit there on the other side of the table with a microphone and pray for me because I would just I would just speak what God put on my heart yeah, yeah. and people continually said to me uh, uh, you know you, you're judgmental and you have no love because I was speaking out against the ills in the church mm, that's right we're exposing but isn't that the role of a prophet that's what I just read exactly. to you exactly God says, you know, the prophets are false prophets if they are not exposing, exposing your iniquity. But listen, so as to restore you from captivity. And this is going to be the heart of our study, mm -hmm. is the purpose of judging. It's to and, restore. Yeah, is to restore when it is righteous. Okay? Right. Um, John the Baptist, what was his ministry? Now Jesus said in John chapter, uh, or Matthew chapter 11, that nobody had a greater ministry up until the time than John the Baptist. A call to repentance. It was a call to repentance. Well, repentance is saying, okay, you're sinning. Right. That's and you've judging. got to repent. It sounds like judging. That's the first message of Jesus Christ. That's right. Repent. That's right. So, you know, like I said, this is not a, a simple topic. Uh, it's one that we really need to get into to understand, but it is ever so important. And I'm going to tell you why it's so important today. In these last days, days that Paul said are perilous, there will be an explosion of false prophets and wolves in sheep's clothing. 
Now, Jesus and Paul both make that perfectly clear. Jesus in Matthew 24, mm -hmm. when the apostles ask him, what are the signs of your, his coming in the last yes. days, right? Yes. And he talks about the false prophets, false messiahs. Mm -hmm. and, and Paul, when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, they're both talking about how there will be this incredible amount of false prophets. Well, the last thing in the world that Satan wants is for believers to be judging or testing those evil workers. Right. And if you are, and if people get up and say things that are ungodly, or leading the people of God astray, well, God is going to raise up people to stand and, and point at them and call them wolves in sheep's clothing. That's right. And call them to task for what they're preaching. Is that judging? Okay. <laughs> the real issue here becomes an understanding of what judgment is that Jesus is speaking of here. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the context that it's being used in. Yes. Because I'm going to read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. This is Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, sending him out because now this is having a great impact on the early church. And Paul says to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing, by his appearing and his kingdom. God is going to judge the living and the dead. Yes. All right? There is the issue of judgment. And we're going to continue. I'm going to get to this. But I just thought the account of the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Mm -hmm. You know this story? Yes. Right? In John chapter 8. If you, if you turn your Bibles to John chapter 8, I'm going to read from the first verse. It says that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did, did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. Mm -hmm. All right. Jesus did not condemn her. That's what he said. Right. I don't condemn you. That's judgment. I, no. Listen to me now. Okay. okay, well, it's a form of judgment. Right. Right? He said, I don't condemn you. But he did judge her to be a sinner. Right. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, Go sin no more. But he didn't condemn her. But he didn't condemn her. Now, actually, the, the Greek words used there are very similar. As a matter of fact, one is kind of an extension of the other. Okay. Condemnation is judging to put something down. Right. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Now, judges in the world, and in the, in the, first of all, you know, there were judges in the, in the early, before there were kings, there were judges. That's how God administered the people of God. Right. Okay. There is such a thing as a righteous judgment. That's what we're going to get into. Okay? Um, and there's such a thing as an unrighteous judgment. Mm -hmm. It's not about condemnation. The Father's judgment is righteous. Jesus didn't condemn this woman caught in adultery. He knew she was caught in adultery. There's no question about that. He judged her to be a sinner. He knew that she was a sinner. But he didn't condemn her. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. Mm -hmm. The Father's judgment is righteous. He is just. So is Jesus. Mm -hmm. So listen to these words of Jesus. All right? And it's really important. Please let these try and sink into you. This is from John 5.30. Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will but the will of him who sent me. 
Okay? Then from John 7, verse 24, Jesus said, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, is, are we getting into a place where it's filled with contradiction? On one hand, he's saying don't judge. On the other hand, he's saying judge, but judge with a righteous judgment. Well, this is why you've got to get this context and understand that it's not about condemnation, that the purpose was, what was his purpose with this woman? It's to to bring her life and to reconcile her to God the Father. That's why he says, go sin no more. Right? right? right. Okay. But it, there, so there's a righteous judgment, but it is not based on what Jesus perceives or anything. Mm -hmm. Because he said that it was, not, I don't do anything on my own initiative. That's right. As I hear, I judge. So he's hearing from the Father. Remember, he said that he didn't speak anything he didn't hear from the Father, right? Then he said, speaking to the religious leaders in John chapter 8, still in John chapter 8, right? Starting in verse 15, Jesus said, You judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. See? I'm telling you, this is a difficult subject, but it is ever, ever, ever so important because we're getting into a time where there are false prophets, false teachers. There are, there are teachers who are teaching according to, their, you know, to the desires of the people, tickling people's ears. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. There are those who come as angels of light, you know. So we have to be able to discern these things. And when you do, Satan or his ministers are going to be saying to you, well, you're too judgmental, you don't have love. And I'm telling you, you better be prepared and you better understand the difference between these things. He went on to say, now I'm going to read to you again. This is from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak as the Father has told me. So, let's just summarize up to this point here, okay? It's only been a few minutes, but it's about, there, there is a righteous judgment, there is an unrighteous judgment. Unrighteous judgment tends towards condemnation. That's what the Pharisees were doing with that woman that was caught. Yes. Jesus recognized that she was a sinner, but did not condemn her. He did judge her, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then gave her instruction to life. God is always, he, he is not a man that he should change. His word stands forever. It says the flower fades, the grass withers, but the word of God will stand forever. God said so many centuries ago, millennia ago, that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life. God's purpose is life. The devil's purpose is death. The devil's purpose, he comes as an adversary to... to, to steal, kill, and destroy. To steal, kill, and de destroy, but to accuse. He's the accuser of the brethren. He comes for condemnation. God came, bringing a message in the form of Jesus Christ, made flesh, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, bringing a message of repentance, calling us from sin. Certainly pointing out the fact that we're sinners. I mean, His very righteousness is the presence of utter, absolute righteousness in the present person of Jesus Christ makes our sin obvious. Yes. But He doesn't do that for condemnation, but to call us into life. To clean us up. To, to save us. Hallelujah. So, let's just talk about the process of, of judgment. There's one thing, uh, before I get into this, I just want to say this. If you see, and I'll, I'll use the term brother generically. So, girls, you're not getting away with anything here. Okay. You're covered under yeah, that. Yeah, covered under that. Okay. If you see a brother teaching in error, for example... There are two distinct possibilities. Mm -hmm. yes. Number one, you're, you're seeing a brother in error. Right. And that brother needs to be gently corrected. Mm -hmm. Or you are seeing a wolf in sheep's clothing, and that brother needs to be bonked oh, on the head. He needs to be walked. Well, okay. that's, that's the truth. Okay, yes. so those are the two possibilities. But Jesus in Matthew 18 talks about, well, if you see your brother in sin, 
right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see your brother sin. Well, if you see that and you recognize it as sin, is that judgment? No. We're supposed to know. You know, this is what ha happened with Adam and Eve when they ate from the tree of fruit. You know That's the right. difference between good and evil. That's right. We're supposed to be able to tell the difference. And we're Remember, God to expose the evil. Yes. God, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and he said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We're supposed to be able to tell the difference between the two. Right. So, yeah, if you see your brother sin, you're supposed to be able to recognize that. But then Jesus gives us a process for how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. All right? Yes. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the process, but I'm going to give it to you based on different verses and, uh, you know, a number of verses and from my perspective. Let's say that you see a brother and or sister, doing something that you know is wrong. Here are nine steps, and you may want to write this down, to dealing with that issue. Mm. Number one, quickly close your mouth. Mm -hmm. Slow to speak. Okay. Number two, run, don't walk, to a mirror and examine yourself. Mm -hmm. Number three, Pray to the Father that you will be blessed as a peacemaker and a vessel of mercy. Number four, test what you have seen against the Word. Right. Number five, pray to the Father that you will be blessed as a peacemaker and a vessel of mercy. Again. That's not a mistake. No, that's again. <laughs> I'm telling you, you got to be prayerful about you gotta this. you got to hear right. from the Father. Okay. Number six, go to that brother and him alone. Number seven, show him his fault in private. Number eight, pray with him for mercy and forgiveness that he might have the peace of God restored to his soul. Number nine, rejoice or mourn depending on the outcome. All right, let me just go through those a little bit slower here, okay? Because this is really, really important. Because we do, and, and the purpose is, this is good fellowship. You know, I say... These are particularly in these days. These are days we need good fellowship. We need to have people as iron sharpens iron, so one man another. We need to have people in our lives who, when they see us doing something that doesn't line up with the word, that they will love us enough to come to us and tell us and make us deal with this thing. Okay. So number one, I said when you see your brother sin, the first thing you got to do is quickly close your mouth. Zip it. Because the tendency is, okay, oh, I'm going to start talking about this. Right. And if you do, you're well, going to be in big... Your first reaction is to react in the flesh. Well... Unfortunately. Everything, we're always... Your flesh is trying to get you to react exactly. in the flesh. Right? Exactly. Yes. But the Word of God says, you know this, in James 1, 19 and 20, it says, This you know, my beloved, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Amen. Now, our purpose is to achieve the righteousness of God. But we just talked about what Jesus said. There is a righteous, like, like there is a righteous anger, by the way. Yes, there is. Jesus got angry. He got angry with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees. Yes. He got angry with the money changers in the temple. He never sinned. He never even knew sin. No. This was a righteous anger. There's such a thing as a righteous anger, and there's such a thing as righteous judgment. Yes. But the simple fact of the matter is, the anger of man never accomplishes the righteousness of God. Amen. So you've got to stop and hear from God. Mm. This is the first thing to do, okay? Because, believe it or not, you could be wrong. Mm. Most All definitely. Them. Most definitely. Did you know that that possibility yes, exists? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So the first thing you want to do, if you, if you think you're seeing a brother sin, the first thing you need to do is get into conversation with the Lord. You need to be listening, mm. not talking, not talking, not talking to that brother yet, no. and especially not, not talking to anybody, anybody else. else. Right. Especially not talking to anybody else, because, you, because that's the tendency of our fallen human nature. Yes. Yes. Okay, so stop. The second thing I said was that point number two is. By, by the way, I said you know what. We, sh we shouldn't talk about what we see in that brother to somebody else. Right. E even if it's in the guise of prayer. Right, right, yes. I, I'm going to tell you, I've been to prayer meetings. One there were, there were gossip, gossip sessions, sessions in disguise. That's right. I'm serious. I know. Oh, that's let's true. pray for Mary. Oh, Mary, she's, she's like a drunk. Pick the bottle oh. in here. <laughs> 
Really? I mean, there's a great danger. Your flesh is nasty. Okay. The second thing is, run to a mirror and examine yourself. And I said, run, don't, don't walk. I mean, because the, the fact of the matter is, there are times that the Lord will make a sin, not the sinner, very visible to you because he's trying to help you deal with that in your life. That's the log and the speck. But, which we'll get to, yes. Mm. When you're having difficulty seeing it in your own life, he'll put it in front of you another way. Mm. This is called refiner's fire. <laughs> well, it is. So, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. All right? And in 2 Corinthians, he says, Test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. So, I, listen, this is a simple a truth. There are times when there's something going on in your life that you're, you've turned a blind eye to. And God will put that thing in front of you, maybe in somebody else's life, to get your attention. So, the first thing you need to do if you see a brother in sin is make sure that that sin doesn't, doesn't live inside of you. Okay, that's what, and we'll talk about this. Jesus is talking about taking the log out of your eye before you take the speck out of your brother's. Don't be a hypocrite, okay? Then right. the third thing I put was, pray to your Father that you'll be blessed as a peacemaker and a vessel of mercy. All right? This is, again, I'm going back to Paul's writing to the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5. He said, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The reason, if, if we're seeing the sin, the, the purpose that we have to have is for them to be... Because you know what? It says in Isaiah, your sin separates you from God. That's right. mm -hmm. It's to see them reconciled to God. That has to be our heart. And Jesus, just a little bit later here in, in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew 18, says, Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you? We have been given grace. We've had mercy poured out on us. Because you, my friend, my brother, my sister, you and me both, we were dirty, rotten sinners. Yes, we are. And it was only the grace of God that has taken the stain of that sin out of our lives. Nothing we did. So let's go back to the letter of James in the second chapter, 12 and 13. He says, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs or rejoices over judgment. Now, think about this, you know, we have the mind of Christ, but we're supposed to have the heart of the Father. Because Peter says, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow about His promise, talking about His coming, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Repentance is a recognition of sin in our lives and a turning from that sin. Changing our minds about that, right. that, that very thing. So, if we don't show mercy to others, this is what it's saying, God's not going to show mercy to us. Remember when we studied not long ago, and, you know, the prayer? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, you know, we're going to be praying to the Father, Father, forgive us the way we forgive others. I said that was dangerous, right? So, here, keep that in mind. That's the purpose. We have to have, both the mind of Christ, that's what it says in Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ, and we need to have the heart of the Father. Otherwise, don't make a move. If you are not being motivated by a heart that desires to see a brother or sister restored, reconciled to a right relationship with the God, the God the Father, do not make a move. Don't go talk to that person about it. Don't go talk to anybody else about it. Just sit up and shut up your face. Because Sorry. you are not equipped to deal with it. Praise God. Okay. That's a real important point. Yes. Now the other thing is, number four, I said, test the error that you've seen against the Word. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's what guides our life, all right? Now Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he said, All Scripture is inspired by God. What it says in the Greek is, it's God-breathed. It is the very breath of God, right? 
and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. God's Word is profitable for reproof and for correction. You've got to be able to take... Listen, I've said this... I, even now, I'll say it again. If you believe that I'm saying something wrong here, I welcome that you, that you would contact me and let me know that. That's right. But let me know by the Word of God. Because I don't, it's not, I don't want to... You know, let me be perfectly frank with you. I don't care about your opinion. I care about the Word of God. And if you can show me that what I'm saying is not correct according to the Word of God, I promise you, I promise you in the name of Jesus Christ that I will repent and change my evil ways. And someone's opinion doesn't have the power to change anything Absolutely not. in his life. No. Only the and, Word of God can do yes. that. And there's a greater danger, and we'll, we'll talk about that. I mean, but it has to be the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So you need to be, if you see something wrong, you better be able to check and make sure that you have Scripture to show that that thing is wrong. Nothing else that you can show clearly from the Word of God, because that's what brings correction and reproof. All right, it's it's time to ensure that what you see is not a failure on the part of someone to live up to your standards or your traditions. You got that? Say it's got to okay. It's got to be the Word. Yes. You have to make sure that what you're seeing is not a failure on the part of someone else to live up to your standards or your traditions rather than the Word of God. And I think that's what happens most often. That happens, well listen, it happened constantly in the New Testament if you never saw this. Mm -hmm. Because the Pharisees and Sadducees were always, always testing by their traditions. Well, judging Jesus, yeah. judging Jesus based on their traditions. traditions. Right. Okay? If you, if you look at John chapter 9, which is the account of the man born blind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in, in the 16th and 24th verses, they said, in the 16th verse, as I recall, they said, the Pharisees said, well, Jesus doesn't keep the Sabbath, so we know he's a sinner. He's not from God. Well, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what they were saying. He's okay. not from God. And then in verse 24, the they said, we know this man is a sinner. Right. Well, they were testing Jesus. They were judging Jesus, but they were not judging him by the word. They were judging him by their traditions. Yeah. I promise you, Jesus never, underline that, Never. Jesus never broke the law. Never. He came to fulfill the law. He was without sin. Which means that he never broke the laws concerning the Sabbath. Yes. But he broke their traditions yes. concerning the Sabbath. Yes. So they were judging him based on their tradition rather than on the Word of God. And that's what got them into trouble. Right. Okay? So you got to make sure that we're not doing the same thing, or you're not doing the same thing, or I'm not doing the same that's right. thing. That's right. That we see somebody, you know, it says, we think they're singing in the wrong key because we happen to sing in this key or they're using a the guitar and we use pipe organs mm -hmm. or you know and and that's what you think is sin because it's our tradition brother if you can't find it in the word of god it's not sin this is that I, I can't tell you how important that is yes. okay the fifth thing i said was exactly the same as the third thing i mm -hmm. said <laughs> and it's i'm telling you it, it, it is worth that double effort, yes. okay? Verses 6, or not verses, the, the six, seventh, and 8 things I said. You remember, go to your brother, points. go to him alone, and, and pray with him. Mm -hmm. Right, points. Mm -hmm. Points, i got to point the eight. Mm -hmm. All right? Galatians 6, one. Paul says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass. And remember, we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God. If any man today says he doesn't have sin, he's a liar and he makes God to be a liar. All right? We all fall short. We all stumble and fall. So, so he writes, Paul writes to the Galatians and said, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. Doesn't this kind of recap what I said before? Looking to yourself. Yes. Make sure that you're not doing the same thing, okay? But it's that... If you're being spiritual, the idea, the goal is to restore that person and you restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Anger, remember, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Alice and I, you know, we started a Christian school, we've started a couple of Christian schools and we had a policy, because you want to know something? It says in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, that God disciplines those whom He loves. Yes. If you want to be a disciple, you got to seek discipline. And we believe in discipline. It is a godly thing. 
what the world calls discipline is generally abuse. That's right. Okay, mm -hmm. they, they don't, they're not, they're not intelligent enough to distinguish between abuse and discipline. That's their problem, not mine. Okay. But we had a policy. If a child did something wrong, we got together with them. We showed them in the Word of God where their action had been wrong. Mm -hmm. We pray with them. Then we discipline them, whatever the, that, that thing, what discipline that thing calls for. And when that's done, we sit down, we pray with them again. And encourage them to not do that, you know, not continue in that thing. There's a gentleness to this. Mm -hmm. Even if it required giving a kid a whap with a with a panel, mm -hmm. is still a spirit of gentleness. Yes. And you want to know something? Those those kids always recognized the love that was behind this. If what you're doing is not motivated by love, you're playing for the wrong team. That's what, you know. That's all I can tell you. I just okay. wanted to interject here that just recently we were at a meeting, Maurice and Joanna, and he, they were, we were talking about discipline, and Maurice was telling us how his son would come to him oh, yeah. <laughs> and tell him, Dad, you have to paddle me because I did, I did this when I did this wrong. And he would always come to his father asking for the, for the discipline. And it was really... A blessing. It, because, absolutely. because he had trained his child yeah. to know that, you know, it says in the Word that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will remove it far from him. That's right. So he had been trained up to understand that this is what it took to get that foolishness out of him. Right. You know... David, by the way, David was a man after God's own heart. David prayed, and you know, I'm just paraphrasing, but he prayed that God would send his discipline into his life and that his head, through, by the way, through his brothers and sisters, and that his mind would not reject the discipline of God. That needs to be our attitude because you want, your flesh doesn't want, like, no. or look for any discipline. No, no, no. We look for ease and comfort and, and to slide by you know, if we've done something wrong. Our spirit. We try to hide it. Like well, but our, but our yeah. spirit that desires life and godliness will seek that discipline yes. because it wants to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Right. Okay. So, restoration should be the only goal that we have. If the brother can't be restored in private, then it becomes a matter of more public yes. dealing with in, inside the body right. of the church. And you can go read that in, in uh, Matthew chapter 18. You know, if he, if he refuses to hear, you go with somebody else. But I mean, if he still refuses to hear, you bring it before the church. There is a plan. Jesus laid out a plan for how you deal with somebody in error within the body of Christ. And we need to start doing this. Amen. And i got to tell you, people, Al said it will hide. You know, the flesh wants to hide when it's yes, caught. Yes. The first thing that Adam did when he, was, when he trespassed, when he sinned, was to go hide himself from God. He hid himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I honestly believe that that's why a lot of people attend giant churches mm -hmm. because it's so easy to hide. There's no relationship between the people. You can be you can be in all kinds of things you shouldn't be in in the midst of one of those big mega churches, and nobody knows because that's nobody right. knows you. That's right. You go to a church, and it says that a pastor should know well the condition, the condition of, his of his flock. Mm -hmm. Shepherd should know well the condition of his flock. If you're in a congregation that's too big for your pastor to know what's going on in your life, if you can hide from your pastor. You're in a church that's too big. Okay. So, anyhow, the ninth thing I said was that the outcome demands that either we rejoice or we mourn. Now think about this. If you've seen a brother in sin and you go to that brother and that brother is restored. It's hallelujah time. Well, let me just tell you. I want to read to you from Luke 15. And I'm sure that you're all familiar with the story. It's the story of the prodigal son. Uh, Right? Yes, yes. The parable, starting in verse 20. Jesus said, So he got up, this is talking about the, the, the prodigal son. Now remember, he'd been living with the pigs. He had, he had done as much wrong as you could do in that situation. It says, So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put, on a ring on his, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. 
That's the heart of the Father who has been watching for that person that sinned to come back, that there might be a celebration. We need to get to that place where we, you know, where we really understand the importance of living righteously or the, the dire consequences of having sin in our lives. And we should have this heart that there's a celebration when somebody is restored. You know, I think, I, I know I shared this probably during this study of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're in England now, and we were here in England last year. We're here for five months this year. And last year I was here, and I had gotten some, um, some computer thingy from, from T-Mobile. Um, okay. for my, you know, so I could get internet broadband on my computer. And I had some difficulty with it when I first got it, so I called up their helpline. Yeah, um, we were in, in the Manchester area, we just come up from London, and I called T-Mobile in London, and I was connected with their, with their helpline, with their, you know, uh, their help desk. Mm -hmm. But so I got a guy, and as I started talking, I asked him where he was, and he was in the Philippines. Right. So I started talking with him, and as I, I, I pray is my habit, I somewhere along the line was sharing with him about Jesus. Oh, I know what it was. He said to me, he, he recognized that I did not have an English accent. Right, right. Those of my British friends who are watching this now may even be able to tell that I'm not British. You should tell where somebody's from by their conversation. conversation. Read Philippians 3.20. Okay, so anyhow, I said, yeah. And he asked me if I was here on vacation. I said, no, I'm here to share about Jesus Christ. And I said, since I'm here you know, to share about Jesus Christ, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to share with you about Jesus Christ. And I started talking to him about the Lord. And as I say, he was in the Philippines. And my goodness, all of a sudden, it's like he's, he's breaking down. Because he's saying to me that he had been saved. But years ago, he had, just, he had backslidden and fallen away from the Lord and was not living right and was not in communication with God. And now he was afraid to come back to God because he was afraid that God would just smite him when he came back. And, and I said, first of all, do you, do you honestly think that it's a coincidence that here I am, an American, sitting in England, talking to you in the Philippines, do you think it was a coincidence that we connected? Not at all. Not at all. And I said, the reason that God has brought us together today is for me to share this with you. And I shared with him, I asked him if he knew the story of the prodigal son, which he did. And I said, I want you to know that the father is not waiting for an opportunity to bonk you on the head. Mm -mm. The father has been standing, watching, waiting eagerly for you to return so that there might be a celebration. Yes. I'm going to cry now. Yeah. Well, as I, I left this conversation with this man, he said, I'm coming home. Hallelujah. He said, I'm coming home. And he started crying. I mean, yeah. I'm on the phone. I never got my computer fixed, by the way. <laughs> well, who cares? <laughs> but here I was, like I said, an American in England talking to a guy in the Philippines. And that's exactly, exactly what it was. God had this great desire to restore him to that right relationship with him. And there was a celebration in yeah. heaven when that sinner that's right. repented and, returned. and returned. That should be our heart when it comes to sin, because remember, the goal of our instruction is love. And this is where, where, where love and mercy rejoice rather than that kind of judgment that brings condemnation. That's right. That's right. God's purpose is to restore. His purpose is life. But if the, the person doesn't, and again, I told you in Matthew 18, Jesus has a plan. If you go to a brother and you do this thing, and he doesn't, he refuses to hear it, and it says, well, you go back with somebody else, and you still, now you, you, two, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is confirmed. And if they still refuse to hear it, then you bring it before the church. We don't do this anymore. No. As a matter of fact, the last time I recall hearing about a church that did it, now I'm going to tell you something. We did it. We've done it in the church where I've, churches where I've passed it. Praise God, we didn't have to do it a lot. No, you, you should <laughs> never have to do it a lot, but the fact, I'll tell you what, you do once it once or twice, not. And yeah. you're going to find you have to do it less than you might have That's thought. That's right. That's because right. people know that you're serious about the Word of God. That's right. Absolutely serious about it. So, you know, but there was a church in Colorado Springs back in, in the mid-80s that did this with a woman who was living in an adulterous situation in the midst of their congregation. Mm -hmm. And she refused to repent, refused to repent, and they brought it in front of the people. And she turned around and sued the church yeah. for an invasion of privacy. 
<laughs> well, the fact of the matter was she won the case. She may have won the case, but she lost the war. Because I'll tell you what, there, <laughs> there are courts, there are courts, there are superior courts and there are supreme courts, but there's only one supreme God, and He is the judge, and He's a righteous judge. So, when that person refuses to repent, I want to read you, thank you, what, what Paul wrote, and again, in the Corinthians. There's a lot of teaching, and there, apparently there's a lot of teaching needed in the church in Corinth. Yes. Excuse me. There's a lot written yeah. about this. Yeah, there's a lot of correction. I mean, the... Yeah, by, by the way, you have to realize that much of the letters that are written in the New Testament are letters of correction. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes, there, there's a lot of encouragement, there's a lot of teaching, there's a lot of training, but there's a lot of correction. Okay? So Paul talks about somebody who had been living in sin and refusing to repent. And he says in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul had his priorities right. You know, he had his mind set on the things above. He had his mind set on eternity. You know, it says that, that God has set eternity upon our hearts. It's not about how you feel right now or in the next ten minutes. It's about how you will live for all eternity. So it's better to turn somebody over to the devil for, you know, whatever it takes. Let me just put it that way. Whatever it takes to get them restored. This is someone that hasn't re responded to the no, steps. No, was confronted and refused, right? So, but now, what Paul is talking about, I said, remember, in the beginning I said, this is the Lord's commentary on what? This sermon blessed on the mount, the blessed are the peacemakers Makers, and the merciful. And the merciful. This sounds like blessed are those who mourn. Oh, yeah. Because if you're not mourning over those people who have fallen in their relationship with the Lord and are living in sin because sin leads to death, well, maybe, maybe you ought to ask yourself, do I really have the mind of Christ in the heart of the Father? Mm -hmm. That's just a thought. Because remember, think of this verse of, uh, in Matthew 23 of Jesus. When he went and said, in the gates of Jerusalem, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers the chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. The heart and the mind of Christ is to draw these people back into a right relationship. Okay? Okay. So, now, let's go on to verse 2. Jesus said, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. You know, I'm, I'm just looking at this and I just realized that the, the first verse, I didn't, I've never noticed this before, is do not judge lest you be judged. I didn't realize that was the verse. I thought that whole part was verse 1. No. Yeah, I'm just saying that. That's verse 1. Okay. All right. Paul wrote to the Galatians and said this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. That's Galatians 6-7. Whatever. Now, I, that, that verse is used all the time when pastors or somebody is trying to get tithes out of you and offerings out of you. But the fact of the matter is, Paul is saying, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that whatever a man sows, he will reap. So, the kind of judgment that you sow is the kind of judgment that you will reap, all right? Now, let me just tell you something. First and foremost, I was judged. Yes. I was found guilty. guilty. And Christ was sentenced to death. Because nothing, 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 nothing mm -hmm. can change the truth of the word that the wages of sin is, is death. death. That's Romans 6.23. Nothing can change that. You know, they can legislate and they can make laws, they can, or the church can overlook things, but the simple fact of the matter is, the unchangeable fact of the matter is, that the wages of sin is death. But Christ, who knew no sin, became my sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, 
He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ literally became my sin. He was placed on trial and found innocent. Huh? John 18, 38. Pontius Pilate said to him, Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, speaking of Jesus, he said, I find no guilt in him. So, he sentenced to death Jesus to pay the price for my sin. John 19, 16 says, So then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Got this? Pontius Pilate puts Jesus on trial. Now, talk about judging. Now remember, Pontius Pilate had the authority to judge. He said that to Jesus. Right. And Jesus said, you'd have no authority except my Father gave it to you. Pontius Pilate represented all the power of the Roman Empire. He sat in a place called the pavement, the judgment seat. That's right. And he put Jesus Christ on trial. He said, I find no guilt in this man. Crucify him. Mm -hmm. Now is that righteous judgment? I'm going to tell you something. It is the most unrighteous judgment that the world has ever known, will ever know. And yet, it totally served the purpose of God the Father. Right. It says, Satan will devise a plan, but God will thwart it and turn it to his own purpose. Mm -hmm. That judgment that deserved to be falling on me fell on Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ willingly took it upon mm -hmm. himself. Okay? I'm glad I got that over with. <laughs> and since I was judged, and the price was paid, then there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right. See, now there's no condemnation. Why? Because, because I was judged, I was found guilty, and the price was paid. Right. It's nothing. So it's been done. Yeah, it's okay? Done. You know, it says it's appointed unto man to die once, and then the judgment. Hallelujah. For I have died, and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus. I've died, I've been judged. I'm glad I got that over with. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I wish we could get these, this is the reality of the Word of God. I wish we could get these truths down, locked in our spirit, locked in our soul, because it will change your attitude about everything in life when you understand this. You know, when the doctor comes along and says, well, you got terminal pimples and you're going to die in an hour and a half. Die. Hey, well, I already did that. <laughs> That's not so bad. You're going to be judged. I was judged. I was found guilty. That's behind me. So forgetting what lies behind, hallelujah, I can now press on towards the goal, mm -hmm. the upward call of God, Christ Jesus. And, right? Okay. So anyhow, remember what I said, the wages of sin is death. But Paul continued on in that very same verse in, in Romans 6.23 to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I was saved by grace. Now grace then becomes the standard of measure that God used on me. Mm -hmm. And grace is the standard of measure that I had better use in my relationship with others. That's, that's simple. I, I think it's simple. You see, fallen human nature, the flesh, becomes and creates its own standards. It's our natural tendency to place ourselves in the center of the universe and ju judge all things By against ourselves. Mm -hmm. our, our standard. Mm. So the problem is always that others don't act the way we do or the way we think that they always should and that's the cause of the problem. Adam judged both God and the woman. Talk about judging, unrighteous judgment. Did he not? Yes. Well, you know what? It says that Adam sinned. Right? Yes. Because he was disobedient to the commandment of God. Here's what Adam said. This is Genesis 3.12. The man said... Now remember, you've got to get this picture in your head. Adam has he has been disobedient to God. The wages of the sin is death. God said to him, the day that you do this, you shall die. All right, but anyhow, so he did this, and the first thing he did was go hide. Yes. And that's our tendency, is to try and hide everything that we've ever done wrong. All right? Mm -hmm. So he hides, but guess what? God found him. Uh, because God came to seek and to find that which was lost. That's right. So he finds Adam and he says, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he says, what are, what are you doing here, Adam? And Adam says to him, the man said, the woman 
who you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. See, here's Adam's judgment. It was God's fault. It was the woman's fault. But Adam was sure it couldn't be his, his fault. Right. I'm that, innocent. <laughs> I'm innocent. In so that became his standard. I mean, you know, by the way, it didn't work out for him. No. And it wouldn't work out for you. Mm -mm. It wouldn't work out for me. Okay? The word that God has spoken, that is the standard by which we are called to live our lives. The word. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is the way that God directs our life. We're not to lean on our own understanding. We're not to judge things by ourselves. By our, and like I said, by our traditions or by ourselves. There, that becomes the true, true danger. You don't, you know, you don't like red cars, so you think nobody should like red cars. You know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm being silly, but you know what I'm talking about. It's like, we think that everybody should think like we do. Mm -hmm. No, no. Well, in a sense, we, we should all think alike because we have the mind of Christ. Exactly. So this is where righteous judgment comes in. If we are thinking like Jesus Christ, then we become of one mind. We become of one spirit. We become one body. We become a life in one accord. And Jesus prayed in the garden on the night he was taken and he said that we are perfected in unity. When we start to think with the mind of Christ, when we start to love with the heart of the Father, when we stop leaning on our own understanding, when we stop thinking that we're the center of the universe, when pride falls, we will start to judge with a righteous judgment and God will use us with that ministry of reconciliation that we will understand how blessed it is to be a peacemaker, how blessed it is to be merciful, how blessed it is to mourn over the lost. I'm telling you because God's desire for your life and God's desire for my life and Alice's life is that we be blessed. Amen. I'm not familiar with, the, uh, with the, the book. I didn't read it in school. Alice did, I'm sure, in English literature. Jane Austen's Pride, Pride and Prejudice. And if you're gonna, when, when you start looking at others, remove all pride, remove all prejudice. Bring in the Word of God and use that Word of God to be an encouragement and a blessing to others. Because today, as long as it's still called today, we are called to encourage one another. Be a blessing to somebody. Listen to me. If you see a brother or sister sin, follow these steps. Mm. Care enough about them that you'll be open to be used by God to restore them to a right relationship with the Father. Hallelujah. Because none of us want to be in sin. It's an ugly place to be. It's an ugly, ugly, ugly place to be. Well, I, I think it's too late to continue on any further. Well, we'll pick this up again in our next session. Hallelujah. Looking forward so, to that. Yeah. So until then, Father, we just thank you, thank Lord God. Jesus. That you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. And you can use us in our weakness, Lord God, to shame the strength of the strong and to perfect your strength in us, Lord God. That you would use us to be a blessing to one another, to touch the lives of each other, Lord God, being an encouragement to draw closer and closer to you day by day. Lord, help us to love one another the way that you've told us to love. With the example of your Son, Christ Jesus, giving up our own lives for the lives of others. Understanding what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, Lord God, that love does not take into account our wrong suffering. Lord God, that we, would, that we would love with that love that you've poured into our hearts through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, our only desire would be to see each and every person in your body grow closer and closer to you. And Lord, I just ask this, Father, in the precious name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, until next time, may the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of His name. And remember to give Him thanks and praise in and for all, all things. things. Amen. Amen.